మార్నింగ్ స్టూడెంట్స్ మీ అందరు రిక్వెస్ట్ చేసినట్టు టుడే డిస్కస్ అబౌట్ ది పరాసిక్ కేజ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఇంపార్టెంట్ పాయింట్స్ వ్యాట్ టు కాన్సన్ట్రేట్ అండ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద డయాగ్రామ్స్ యు సపోజ్ టు డ్రా వెల్ ఆన్సరింగ్ ద పరాసిక్ కేజ్ దీస్ థింగ్స్ వి డిస్కస్ టుడే అండ్ వాట్ ఇట్స్ క్లినికల్ ఇంపార్టెన్స్ క్లినికల్ ఇంపార్టెన్స్ ఈజ్ అవర్ అల్టిమేట్ ఎయిమ్ ఓకే క్లినికల్లీ how the thoracic cage is useful the knowledge of the anatomical knowledge of the thoracic cage is useful to apply in the clinical practice these are the things we are going to discuss today first what is thoracic cage the thoracic cage it is a osseo cartilaginous elastic structure and it protects the thoracic cavity protects the thoracic cavity that is the most important thing suppose if you take the thoracic cage it protects the most important structures which are related with the circulation and respiration circulation and respiration the structures which are concerned with the circulation and respiration these two important systems they are protected with the help of the thoracic cage not only these structures and again other structures that is uh, you know the sub thoracic region there are sub uh, hypochondriac region hypochondriac region or sub diaphragmatic region it is also providing uh, protection to the important structures especially the liver on the right side and the spleen on the left side and stomach also it is also protected by the this thoracic cage that is thoracic cage okay that is the most uh, important function of the thoracic cage okay next uh, what are the boundaries of the thoracic cage that is also you must know what are the what is anterior boundary what is posterior boundary okay and in the sides also what are the structures which are related with the thoracic cage what are the structures which are taking part in the formation of the thoracic cage that is the very very important suppose if you take the posterior midline posterior midline that is uh, ral thoracic vertebrae and intervertebral discs thoracic vertebrae along with the intervertebral discs they are taking part in the formation of the posterior boundary to the thoracic cage it is in the midline to take in the sides the sides also or if you take on the sides of the this vertebral column there are ribs the ribs are coming like this and the posterior part of the ribs also taking part in the formation of posterior boundary of the thoracic cage posterior boundary of the thoracic cage and anteriorly it is bounded by sternum okay already you know this is the thoracic cage you see here this is the sternum this is the manubrium sternae this is the body of the sternum and jiffy sternae these are the three parts of the sternum okay these are all the ribs these are all the ribs and here and this part is called it is the thoracic inlet thoracic inlet and below this at this area there is a thoracic outlet thoracic outlet this is the inlet this is the outlet here you see the inlet is narrower when compared with the outlet okay and here anterior boundary of the thoracic wall that is in the anterior mid in the midline this is the jiffy sternum body of the there is a manubrium sternae body of the sternum and jiffy sternum along with the costal cartilages this blue color is the costal cartilage and this one is the rib this is the costochondral junction costochondral junction these are all the costochondral junctions costochondral junctions here in the anterior part this is the manubrium sternae body of the sternum jiffy sternum and costal cartilages and the anterior part of the anterior part of the ribs these are all the structures they are taking part in the formation of the anterior boundary anterior boundary of the thoracic wall anterior boundary of the thoracic wall so next you see on the sides on the both the sides this side and this side you see ribs these are the there are 12 pairs of ribs 12 pairs of ribs that is the right side 12 ribs left side 12 ribs in between these ribs there are spaces they are called intercostal spaces intercostal spaces 
these intercostal spaces they are filled with the muscles they are called by muscles and i think these muscles there are structures that is neurovascular bundles neurovascular bundles that is nerve and blood vessels now say blood vessels there are present in the intercostal space we see in detail about the what are the structures in the intercostal spaces we see okay here on the both the sides of the is a uh, thorax this uh, boundary it is formed by ribs 12 pairs of ribs this is the first rib and this is the 12th rib 12th and 11th ribs they are called floating ribs because they are not reaching the postal margin they are not reaching the postal margin because of this reason we call it as a uh, floating ribs floating ribs okay these are all the structures that are taking part in the formation of the boundary or boundaries of the thoracic cavity what is of the thoracic cavity and here another important landmark you have to identify that is the sternal angle in between the angle between the meridian sternae and body of the sternum meridian sternae and body of the sternum there is a an angle this is called sternal angle this is also called angle of lewis angle of lewis or sternal angle okay this is nothing but the cartilaginous joint meridian sternal joint Uh, at this level there is an angle this is called sternal angle sternal angle this is very very important clinically because there are many events that are taking place at this level okay that is the that is why the sternal angle it is very very important clinically there are 10 events that are taking place at the level of the sternal angle okay these 10 events you are supposed to know what are the structure events which are taking place at the level of the sternal angle that is also very very important okay what are the events first uh, it is a sternal angle it is very very important landmark because the second rib to count if you want to count the ribs because in do, uh, in performing many uh, procedures for the thoracic wall you have supposed to know about the what to which vertebral level you are going or which rib level you are going into the thoracic cavity that knowledge is very very important that is essential you must know that much knowledge while entering into the thoracic cavity or any invasive procedure over the thoracic wall you must know at which level you are going if you want to count the ribs first you have to identify the sternal angle that is the most important point regarding the sternal angle because the second rib it corresponds at the level of the sternal angle the second rib it corresponds with the sternal angle you see this is the second rib it corresponds with the sternal angle this is the sternal angle that is if you want to count below third fourth fifth like this you can count that is the most important point and next is uh, suppose if you take the sternal angle level in the thorax above it is supplied by the uh, c4 segment of the cervical region and below this level it is supplied by the cutaneous supply by the t2 segment of the spine t2 segment of the spine that is also another important point at, at the level of importance at the sternal angle this is also you must know and next another important point the sternum moves forwards and backwards the sternum moves forwards and backwards during respiratory movements at the level of the sternal angle here usually in the, by the age of 60 years by the age of 60 years this cartilaginous joint is replaced by bone is replaced by bone and here this is the another joint this is the meridian sternal joint okay this is the meridian sternal angle or meridian sternal joint and gyphi sternal joint this is replaced by bone by the age of 40 years by the age of 40 years here this is why this uh, at this level the sternum moves backwards and forwards during respiratory movements that is also very very important point related with the sternal angle next uh, the trachea divides into two the two principal bronchus two principal bronchus just below the sternal angle level and in the adults suppose if you take the children um, it is just above the just above the level of the sternal angle in adults it is just below the sternal angle. okay that is also another important landmark next uh, the junction between the it is a junction between the superior and inferior mediastinum it is a junction point between the superior and inferior mediastinum superior mediastinum above the sternal angle 
Eucalyptus mediastinum, the central part, middle part of the thoracic cavity. Eucalyptus superior mediastinum, below the sternal angle, we call it a inferior mediastinum. That is also another. It here the sternal angle it corresponds with the fourth thoracic vertebral body, lower part of the fourth thoracic vertebral level. Lower part of the body of the fourth thoracic vertebral level. That is the it corresponds with the sternal angle. That is also another important. And next is the thoracic duct. Already we studied thoracic duct is a lymphatic duct. It starts from the abdomen and it pierces the diaphragm. Then it enters into the mediastinum. And in the mediastinum, it runs in the right side, the right side up to the level of the sternal angle. After that, at the level of the sternal angle, it deviates towards the left side from right to from right to left. It deviates. That is also another important point at the level of the sternal angle. And there is a starting and ending of the arch of aorta. Starting and ending of the arch of aorta is also occurring at this level. That is the starting and ending. Arch of aorta, already know. Arch of aorta. It is a ascending aorta. It continues as the arch of aorta. Then it can downwards as a descending thoracic aorta. Okay. This is a ascending aorta ends as a arch of aorta at the same external angle level. And uh, at the this arch of aorta, it continues as a descending thoracic aorta at the level of the sternal angle. So both the sides, okay, both are corresponds with the sternal angle. That is also another important point. Next, uh, that is uh, the attachment of the superior post, the sternopericardial ligament. Sternopericardial ligament. There are two sternopericardial ligaments. There is superior and inferior. The superior sternopericardial ligament is at the level of the sternal angle. The level of the sternal angle, and at the same time, another important point at the sternal angle, the both the anterior borders, both the anterior borders of the lungs, anterior borders of the both the lungs, they approximate with each other at the level of the sternal angle. At the level of the sternal angle, okay, that is also another important point. Next, the superior vena cava, superior vena cava, it pierces the fibrous pericardium. Superior vena cava pierces the fibrous pericardium, then it enters into the pericardial sac. Okay, at the same time, at this level, it also receives the arch of ajagas vein. Arch of ajagas vein. Ajagas vein also at, at the level of the this, uh, sternal angle. Okay, these are all the different uh, events which are occurring at the level of the sternal angle. That is why, in our examination point of view or in your clinical point of view also, the sternal angle is very, very important. Very, very important. And you must know what is sternal angle. What, what is also called angle of Lewis. Angle of Lewis. And what is its clinical importance. These things you must know. This is very, very important. Sternal angle. That is about the sternal angle. Okay. Here. Next, uh, what are the remaining parts which are taken? Here you take a uh, vertebrae. That is the vertebrae. There are uh, how many vertebrae? 12 thoracic vertebrae. 12 thoracic vertebrae. And the, usually the thoracic vertebrae they are forming anterior concavity, anterior curvature, anterior concave curvature that is called primary curvature. Primary curvature means this curvature it occurs by the birth. And in the embryonic life itself is a curvature that is why it is called primary curvature. Okay. And if you go from above downwards, from above downwards, from T1 to T12, there is an increase in the size of the body of the thoracic vertebrae. There is an increase in the size of the body of the thoracic vertebrae. Actually, if you take the spinal vertebral column, total vertebral column, from above downwards, from above downwards, there is a gradual increase in the size of the body of the vertebrae. That is a very, very important point. Here also, Suppose if you take the upper uh, thoracic vertebrae body and features, they are looking like a cervical. But if you take the lower uh, these vertebrae, they are looking like a lumbar. Okay, that is why there is a gradual change in the vertebrae of the thoracic fascia. Okay, that is the thing. Next, if you come to the ribs, there is a, the other, another important structure. It takes part in the formation of the uh, thoracic cage. That is a uh, ribs. How many pairs of ribs there are? 12 pairs of ribs. Out of these, uh, 
first two are very very important first rib and second rib first rib and second rib they are short when compared with the other ribs and they are horizontally arranged remaining are vertically arranged and uh, last two also special that is uh, 11th and 12th because they are floating ribs they are floating ribs and that is a, another one classification floating ribs and costochondral ribs and some ribs are true ribs are typical ribs and some are atypical ribs. that is a typical ribs that is 3rd to 9th 12th to 9th they are typical ribs typical ribs because these are these are very difficult to differentiate whether it is a third rib or ninth rib all are having common features common features the so remaining ribs that is a first second and 10th 11th and 12th they are having different features you can identify the these ribs with the help of the their some points suppose if you take the first rib it is horizontally placed and it is a very short rib short rib and if you take the second rib it is also horizontal almost obliquely placed and it is when it is length is just two times more than the first rib but remaining ribs are not like that they are different in structure okay at the same time they are also having that is a, in the head of the rib there is a costal facies okay like that there are different features to study yeah? in detail about the especially concentrate on the first rib second rib these two are very very important clinically and last one is also very important twelfth rib that is the twelfth rib it is having and, and already you know that is the ribs that they are having a head tubercle angle groove all these features in the twelfth rib there is no angle there is no costal groove there is no uh, tubercle okay there is no angle okay there is these are all the special features and at the same time the 12th rib it is providing attachment to the muscles important muscles of the that is the back of the uh, abdomen and back of the thorax okay these muscles especially the back muscles of the abdomen they are attached to the 12th rib that is called especially the quadratus the thoracor quadratus lumborum okay these are also important muscles that are attached to the this uh, 12th rib that is why the 12th rib is also special we have must be in position to identify the 12th rib and what are the attachments of the 12th rib all these things you must know and uh, coming to the vertebrae these two uh, the, the characteristic feature of the thoracic vertebrae is uh, presence of the costal facies presence of the costal facies that is very very important by the seeing the costal facies we can say it is the thoracic vertebrae it is a thoracic vertebrae some are having full facets some are having only demi facets and the upper part there is one small facet and then in the lower part of the body also there is another facet like that you have to in a position to identify or differentiate you have to concentrate on the what are the differentiating points of the you, you can study about the typical features of the all the thoracic vertebrae but you must be in a position to differentiate the atypical vertebrae that is especially first and last that is 10th 11th 12th these are all they are having some special features that is in the second it is having its own features like that you have to we are in a position to differentiate the this identify the this thoracic vertebrae with the help of the special features of the that is also you must know okay and next going to the another important point there is a sternum already you know that is you have to study in detail about the what are the different uh, surfaces of the sternum that is anterior surface posterior surface what are the structures related to the posterior surface and what are the attachments and what are the attachments of the anterior surface and all these things you have to know and what is the clinical importance of the sternum is also very very important here what are the abnormalities of the sternum that is very very important because the sternum especially the malbrand sternae and body of the sternum these are the two most important sites where you go for the sternal puncture sternal puncture if you want to assess the uh, bone marrow status of the individual if you suppose if one patient came with uh, some abnormality in the blood cells and the blood cell counts okay if you want to assess the, the total what is the picture what is the status of the bone marrow of the individual you have to take if you want to take the bone marrow from the patient we have to 
put a needle in the sternum and you have to drill into the bone marrow of the sternum then you can aspirate the bone marrow with the help of the needle okay that is the uh, that procedure is called sternal puncture sternal puncture that is, uh, this is the most commonly and because it is the most supervision that is why it is most commonly used site for the bone marrow aspiration perhaps okay that is the number number one and next is uh, there is in the formation of the thoracic cage especially the anterior part of the thoracic cage there are some abnormalities there are some abnormalities that is sometimes there will be funnel shaped chest funnel shaped chest means uh, are this also called pectus cavus excavators pectus excavators that means upper part is flat but lower part of the chest is elevated like this that is called funnel chest funnel chest and another abnormality phygian chest phygian chest or pectus carnatus pectus carnatus or phygian chest that is another type of abnormality in this abnormality what happens there is a defect in the there is a problem with the proliferation of the cartilaginous part of the ribs that is especially the cartilage on the costochondral junction there is a problem because of the abnormal proliferation of this this costal cartilages of the ribs so the, the, the thoracic the anterior part of thoracic cavity comes front like this okay this is called pectus carnatus or pigeon chest pigeon chest this is also another important uh, clinical point related with the uh, sternum and next is uh, if you want to suppose if the patient is uh, comatose it is a deeply in coma he is an, he is not conscious unconscious patients if you want to wake them they have to put like this and you can do work their knuckles their knuckles if you press like this because it is highly painful because it is a superficial area and the periosteum is nervous it is highly pain sensitive if you do like this the patient may come to consciousness that is also most commonly used to say to awake the comatose patients comatose patients and another important thing during uh, already we know there is uh, open heart surgery open heart surgery during that time we have to give incision along the thorax along the sternum that is in the, in the midline of the sternum they give incision that is called thoracotomy sternotomy 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 is they cut the sternum in the midline and then they retract the this uh, sternum on both sides then you can enter into the thoracic cavity and then uh, you, you reach the pericardium then you approach the Okay, that is the sternotomy. After close, after op operation, they close the, they stitch the sternum with the help of the, some wires. Or nowadays they are using staples. Okay, that is the another important thing. Okay, next coming to the ribs. What is the importance of the ribs? You must know. Well, here they, these are the, they are made up of. Here, if you take the rib, this part is the osseous. This is the cartilage. Okay. Okay, this is the osseous. It means it is formed by bone, and this is formed by cartilage. Okay, each rib it is uh, it is formed by cartilaginous part and osseous part, bony part and cartilaginous part. Okay, and here the rib fractures are most common in the clinical practice. So rib fractures, especially during road traffic accidents or during injury due to fighting or due to some compression over the thoracic cavity. Okay, most common fractures is the rib fractures are most common during chest injury. Chest injury. Here, if the chest injury occurs, what happens? The ribs they pierce the thoracic cavity and it may produce uh, nemo hemothorax. Nemo hemothorax. Okay, nemo means air remain collected in the thoracic cavity and the blood also may blood may also collect in the thoracic cavity, especially the pleural cavity. In between the visceral and parietal, in between the space between the visceral and parietal, usually there is a, there is a thin film of fluid in, the, in between the two layers of the pleura. It allows the expansion during the respiratory movements, free expansion. It prevents friction and it allows the lung freely expand. Okay. Here, if there is any damage to the ribs, they may cause, they may pierce the parietal pleura. And sometimes they may also pierce the visceral pleura and it may cause damage to the lungs. In that occasion, it produces hemo, nemo, hemo, nemo, sometimes only hemothorax, 
sometimes only pneumothorax and most of the occasions uh, due to the damage to the lungs it produces hemopneumothorax that is the most dangerous and life threatening form in surgical emergency in that occasion you have to go for there is a icd intercostal drainage intercostal icd means intercostal drainage tube you have to introduce the intercostal drainage tube if you want to introduce the intercostal drainage tube confidently you must know at which level of the thoracic vertebrae what are the structures at which level you have to introduce the icd tube this is very very important and at the same time what are the structures which are present in the inter intercostal space what are the structures in the typical intercostal space what are the muscles what are the vessels what are the nerves and this knowledge is helpful for us while dealing with the this procedures that is intercostal drainage if you want to introduce intercostal drainage to or if you want to aspirate free that is the paracentesis paracentesis that is the aspiration of fluid collected in the oral cavity okay that is hydrothorax hemothorax pneumothorax and pyothorax hylothorax there are different clinical conditions okay in all these conditions if you want to drain the fluid from thoracic cavity you must have an idea about that where you have to introduce that because you are doing invasive procedure you must be very careful while entering into the patient's body because you must have a proper idea what are the structures in the particular area suppose if you put if you put the ear needle here it may cause uh, direct injury to the heart the patient may die on the table okay or if you put uh, without knowing proper knowledge it may cause damage to the intercostal nerves and blood vessels okay because of this reason you must have a proper idea about the intercostal space what are the intercostal spaces and what are the structures which are present in the intercostal space this knowledge is very very important okay next coming to the intercostal space okay or uh, before that sometimes uh, in the ribs there are abnormal ribs that is also clinically very very important and in your examination point of view sometimes they ask uh, cervical rib cervical usually in the cervical region there is no rib only ribs are in the thoracic region what you know okay but sometimes uh, the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra seventh cervical vertebra it may along may along and it may look like a rib may look like a rib in here what is the problem with the rib is uh, it compresses over the at the thoracic inlet there are some structures that is uh, you see here this is the inlet of the thorax inlet of the thorax in the transverse diameter of the inlet of the thorax is 10 cm 10 cm this diameter and antero posterior diameter is uh, 5 cm 5 cm you see this is the first thoracic vertebra it is forming the anterior boundary of the thoracic inlet and this is the sternum like especially the upper border of the manubrium sternum it takes part in the formation of the anterior boundary on both sides this is the first rib inner border of the first rib this totally is the thoracic inlet thoracic inlet here the thoracic inlet it is covered by a special membrane that is called supra pleural membrane supra pleural membrane supra pleural membrane or simpson fascia this is also very very important supra pleural membrane or simpson fascia this is also very important short answer you must study about that it is a musculo aponeurotic sheath it is a musculo aponeurotic sheath the muscular part of the this supra pleural membrane it is formed by scalenus minimus muscle scalenus minimus muscle it takes part in the formation of the muscular portion of the suprapleural membrane and the aponeurotic part it is formed by the endothoracic fascia okay okay endothoracic fascia endothoracic fascia and uh, scalenus minimus muscle these two muscle part structures they are taking part in the formation of the suprapleural membrane suprapleural here this is the cervical pleura or the cervical dome of the the lung is like this for this there is a cervical pleura above this cervical pleura there is a suprapleural membrane like this suprapleural membrane and the suprapleural membrane posteriorly it is attached to the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra transverse process of the seventh cervical 
Yeah? And uh, laterally, lateral on both sides, and laterally, it is attached to the inner border of the first. Inner border of the first tip. You see, the posteriorly, it is attached to the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra. And laterally, it is attached to the inner border of the first rib. And medially, it continues with the pre-tracheal layer of the cervical, deep cervical fascia. Okay. Pre-tracheal layer of the cervical fascia. Deep pre-tracheal layer of the cervical fascia. Here, it is protects the apex of the lung. It protects the apex of the lung from the above structures. Okay. Just above this uh, supraplural membrane, there are uh, trunks of brachial flexes. And there is a subclavian vessel, subclavian nerve and artery. They are all passing through the over the supraplural membrane, supraplural membrane, and it separates the, the apex of the lung from the cervical structures. That is why clinically the supraplural membrane is also very very important. Because suppose if you want to put a, a central line, central line, if you want to you you, you want to put a central line, you are introducing central line from here into the Subclavian, subclavian artery, subclavian vein. Okay, subclavian vein. We, we, at, the, at the time of entry into the subclavian vein, you may cause damage to the supraplural membrane and it may produce damage to the pleura. That is especially the lung, pecs of the lung. It may produce pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. That is why the supraplural membrane is also very, very important. And seventh rib. That is a sorry, cervical rib. Cervical rib is also very, very important. Here at this level, the cervical rib it may compress over the trunks, roots of the brachial flexors, and it may compress over the subclavian artery, subclavian artery. And uh, that is why you see this is the first rib. Over this, there is a suprapleural membrane. And the subclavian artery it comes like this, and subclavian vein it goes like this. And the, the, the trunks of the brachial plexus there also comes like over this. Okay, in between the first rib and the, the, the cervical, the, the seventh rib, cervical rib, there may be compression over the this uh, structure. That is why the seventh rib, the cervical rib is also very, very important. Okay. This is the thoracic inlet and its importance. Okay, if there is a cervical rib, that is if it is compressing over the roots of the brachial flexors and the subclavian artery and the vessels and it may cause this is called a special clinical condition that is called thoracic inlet syndrome thoracic inlet syndrome thoracic inlet syndrome that is the, there is compression over the roots of the brachial flexors and the compression over the subclavian artery due to cervical rib that condition is called thoracic inlet syndrome thoracic inlet syndrome because it produces own manifestations in different conditions, positions of the neck. Okay, that is why it is clinically this important. Next, you see here, this is the thoracic outlet. This is covered by diaphragm. This is the central tendon of the diaphragm. These are the peripheral margins of the diaphragm. They take the origin from the diffuse sternum and posterior part, it is from the bodies, vertebrae of bodies, and it takes origin from the ribs. Okay, 11th and 12th ribs. 11th and 12th ribs. Okay, this is the thoracic outlet. That is the inlet. Okay, these are all the things. Next, coming to the another important thing, there is a intercostal space. Intercostal space. Okay, intercostal space. In between the costa, there is a space. These intercostal spaces, intraosseous spaces, and intercartilaginous space. Total intercostal space, this is the intercostal space. Again, this intercostal space, it is divided into two parts. That is, uh, in between the two ribs. That is, a uh, bony part of the ribs and intercartilaginous part. Interosseous part and intercartilaginous part. And each intercostal space, it is filled with uh, three muscles. Three muscles. That is, uh, internal, external intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle, and innermost intercostal muscle. External, internal, and innermost intercostal muscles. Okay, the, out of these three, the innermost intercostal muscle it is present only in the middle one two fourths of the inter, intercostal space. Intercostal space. The remaining two, that is, suppose if you take the external intercostal muscle, it is uh, anteriorly it is replaced by membrane, 
and posteriorly it is muscular. If you take the internal intercostal muscle, it is anteriorly it is muscular and posteriorly it is membranous. Okay, and, yeah, posteriorly it forms the anti posterior intercostal membrane. Anteriorly it forms the muscle. Okay, like that there are three muscles in between the internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle. Internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle. There is a space uh, that is called that space is occupied by nerves and blood vessels. That is why it is called intra-neurovascular plane. Neurovascular plane. In the intercostal space, the neurovascular plane is in between the internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle. If there is no intercostal, innermost intercostal muscle in some areas, it is directly it is resting on the pleura. Directly resting on the pleura within the endothoracic fascia. Within the endothoracic fascia, it is directly resting on the pleura within the endothoracic fascia. Here, in between the thoracic wall and the pleura, that is especially the parietal pleura, there is a one connective tissue layer, connective tissue layer that is called endothoracic fascia. Endo thoracic fascia and within the if suppose if there is no already I told you that is innermost intercostal muscle you see here this is the external intercostal muscle and this is the internal intercostal muscle and this is the innermost intercostal muscle in some areas especially the anteriorly and posterior part of the this thoracic cage there is no innermost intercostal muscle again in the inter innermost intercostal muscle if there is no innermost intercostal muscle the blood vessels and nerves, that is the neurovascular binding, it is present within the endothoracic fascia and it directly rests on the parietal pleura. You see here different walls. If you want to introduce any needle, any needle from here, from here, this is the skin, this is the so skin, within the skin, there is a superficial fascia, then this is the, there is no deep fascia in the thoracic fascia. So external intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle, nermost intercostal muscle, parietal pleura. Visceral pleura, lung. Okay, these are all the layers which are present in the each in the thoracic wall. If you want to introduce needle, you have to pass through all the these structures. Okay, that is why suppose if you introduce any needle or any tube at this level, it may cause damage to the neurovascular fund. Or if you introduce at this level, it may cause neurovascular damage. So we have to introduce in the middle. The middle that is the very very important critical point. Okay, here this is the external intercostal, this is the internal intercostal, that is the innermost intercostal muscle. The internal intercostal spaces are very very important. There are 11 in number. The intercostal spaces are 11 in number. That is, uh, there are 12 ribs in between the two ribs, there is one space. So, there is uh, no, ribs are 12 in number, but the intercostal spaces are 11 in number on each side. We at each side. In the last rib, that is the 12th rib, below the 12th rib also there is a neurovascular bundle. We call it as subcostal nerve and vessels. Subcostal nerve and vessels. Okay, that is the other important point. And what are the boundaries of the intercostal space? What are the boundaries of the intercostal space? That is also important. Anteriorly or above, if you take the above, the upper boundary, this is the above and this is the below. Okay, above it is formed by lower border of the upper rib. Lower border of the upper rib. And below it is formed by upper border of the outer lip of the lower rib. Outer lip of the upper border of the lower rib. Okay. And anteriorly it is formed by lateral margin of the sternum. And posteriorly it is formed by the corresponding body of the corresponding body. Body of the corresponding body. Okay. Body of the corresponding vertebrae. Classic vertebrae. These are the boundaries in between anteriorly by the sternal margin, and posteriorly by the body, and above by the lower border of the upper rib or lower inferior lip of the lower upper border, upper rib, and below it is formed by upper border of the, especially outer border lip of the upper border of the lower. Okay, these in between these boundaries there is a space that is called intercostal space intercostal space these intercostal spaces are very very important clinically because each space here again these spaces there are two parts that is one is the inter osseous part and inter part okay you see to take the longitudinal section 
atomic middle section of the this intercostal space this is the arrangement of the this uh, diagram is very very important okay okay you must practice all of you must practice the intercostal space and this is the transverse process of the thoracic vertebrae and here this is the innermost intercostal muscle this is the internal intercostal muscle this is the external intercostal muscle you see here you observe and above outside this this is the pectoralis major muscle pectoralis major muscle so this is the anterior part this is the sternum and this is the body of the thoracic vertebrae okay in between these two this is the intercostal space here what are the structures you see here outside this is the external intercostal muscle anteriorly it is replaced by anterior intercostal membrane anterior intercostal membrane and if you take the internal intercostal muscle anteriorly it is muscular and posteriorly it is replaced by membrane posterior intercostal membrane posterior intercostal membrane and here this is the innermost intercostal muscle it is not a continuous muscle like the anterior intercostal inner external internal intercostal muscle is present it is present in the part part okay bits this is the this part of the anterior part is called subcostalis and this part is called this is the another part internal innermost internal intercostal that is intimus or innermost intercostal muscle and this part is called subcostalis this part is called subcostalis so it's not continuous muscle okay and here this dotted line this dark dotted area this is nothing but the endothoracic fascia endothoracic fascia just below the endothoracic fascia this is the parietal pleura or costal pleura parietal pleura or costal pleura okay these are all the structures which are present in the intercostal space in between the internal intercostal muscle and innermost intercostal muscle this area is called neurovascular plane neurovascular plane within the neurovascular plane there are three structures that is one artery one vein and one nerve that is intercostal nerve intercostal artery and intercostal vein here the vein arteries the, the, of the intercostal space they are divided into two parts that is uh, anterior intercostal arteries and posterior intercostal arteries anterior intercostal artery and posterior intercostal arteries here the anterior intercostal arteries they are the branches of the upper six they are branches of the internal thoracic artery internal thoracic artery the internal thoracic artery itself is a branch from the subclavian especially the first part of the lower surface of the subclavian artery then it enters to the thoracic cavity behind the post postoclavian that is sternoclavicular joint then it gives branches to the this intercostal spaces that is there are two intercostal arteries anterior intercostal arteries two inter anterior intercostal artery in each place each space there are direct branches from the internal thoracic artery especially the upper six and below that level there is a below the seventh one this is internal thoracic artery divides into two parts that is one is the supra superior epigastric artery and below it is continues as the musculophrenic artery musculophrenic artery and superior epigastric artery and the remaining branches are the these branches for the musculophrenic artery musculophrenic artery below the level of the seventh intercostal space seventh intercostal space and below that these intercostal anterior intercostal arteries are the branches from the musculophrenic artery above that level there are direct branches from the internal thoracic artery at the same time this internal thoracic artery it is also very very important because it is the main source of blood supply to the breast especially in female especially in the female in lactation it needs a rich blood supply and it is supplied by the internal thoracic artery especially the perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery the supply to the mammary mammary okay and this internal thoracic artery gives not only the phrenico uh, this musculophrenic uh, artery and superficial epigastric artery epigastric artery it also gives capillary cardiac phrenic artery and the anterior intercostal arteries perforating arteries muscular phrenic arteries and superior epigastric these are all the branches of the internal thoracic artery okay and during what is another important clinical point related to the internal thoracic artery internal thoracic artery it is very important short tunnels very important short tunnels internal thoracic artery it is mostly most commonly used for the bypass grafting bypass grafting because it is very closely related with the heart 
in its course. And sometimes the grafting artery, one end may they uh, attach to the coronary arteries, another end may attach to the internal thoracic arteries. Internal thoracic artery. That is why this internal thoracic artery is also very, very important. That is the internal thoracic artery. Next, the posterior intercostal arteries, uh, mostly they are branches from the thora descending thoracic, uh, thoracic aorta. Descending thoracic is a single in number, one in number, but anterior intercostal arteries are two in number. Two in number one runs along the lower quarter of the are within the postal groove, and another one, another branch, it runs over the upper border of the lower, upper border, upper border of the lower. Okay, see here. Okay, that is the. Next, coming to the posterior intercostal arteries. Posterior intercostal, posterior intercostal arteries. Posterior intercostal artery. They are directly branches from the thoracic aorta, and the upper two, upper two or three spaces. They are directly branches from the costo cervical trunk. Costo cervical trunk. This costo cervical trunk again. It is a branch from the subclavian, subclavian artery, subclavian artery. And here from this, uh, there are branches. They are coming and they are going and they are supplying the intercostal space. Intercostal space. Okay, they are supplying the intercostal space. Okay, see here. These are the intercostal. This is the posterior intercostal artery. It is the abdominal aorta, thoracic aorta. Direct branches from the thoracic aorta. Here, it, before entering into the intercostal space, it passes behind the, this is the thoracic duct, and this is the ejecus vein, and this is the sympathetic chain. Sympathetic chain. Okay, behind the sympathetic chain, ejecus vein, and thoracic duct. Enters, then it enters into the intercostal space. Intercostal space. Here again, in the, within the intercostal space, the arrangement of the structures is also very, very important. Van relation from above downwards. From above downwards, this is the first one is the vein. Next is the artery. Below that, this is a nerve. Okay, these are the three structures that are arranged in the within the intercostal space. Okay, this intercostal space diagram is very, very important. Okay, you see here, this is the intercostal space these are this is the arrangement of the structures arrangement of the structures in the except the first intercostal space except the first intercostal space from in the first intercostal space the arrangement is reverse first nerve then artery then vein okay that is because it is horizontal anteriorly now next is the artery next is the vein okay that is a exception from the intercostal space that is a this area is called postal group. This area is called postal group. Okay. These are the next uh, other important point that is uh, intercostal now. Intercostal now. What is the course of the intercostal now? This is also very, very important. What is the typical intercostal? They may ask for the, the intercostal space itself is a essay course. They may ask for the essay course in intercostal space. If they ask an intercostal space, we have to draw all these diagrams. That is uh, this one, what you are seeing. Next, this one, and uh, this one. This diagram also we have to draw. Intercostal to show the, if you want to show the intercostal now. Here, the intercostal now, there are 11 intercostal nerves. 11 intercostal nerves. That is, uh, here, the how the intercostal nerve is formed, this is also very, very important. Okay, you see here. This is the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, this is the anterior root. This is the posterior root. Okay, this is the posterior root ganglia. Posterior root ganglia. Together they form the spinal nerve. Typical spinal nerve. And immediately after that, within the that is vertebral foramen, uh, it divides into two. That is the anterior ramus. This is the posterior ramus. The anterior ramus. This is one. It continues as the intercostal nerve. Okay. And before it continuing as the intercostal nerve, it is also communicated with the 
sympathetic chain. Sympathetic chain through the gray ramai communicates and white ramai communicates. Okay, this is the that is it is the connection between the pre, these are called preganglionic fibers. These are called postganglionic fibers. The preganglionic fibers they are called white ramai communicants. Post ramai postganglionic fibers are gray ramai communicants. Here. Before entering into the intercostal space, it also reports or it sends some fibers to the local sympathetic ganglion. Local sympathetic ganglion because it is also supplying to the, the uh, some structures that they are controlled by some vessels and uh, some muscles, especially erector pylori muscle and blood vessels. They are all uh, receiving sympathetic nerve supply through the intercostal nerve. That is why it is reporting to the sympathetic connected to the lymphatic chain, then it will continues at the intercostal. Okay, so this is the white ramai communicants, this is the gray ramai communicants. Then here it continues at the uh, intercostal. Okay, within the intercostal space, after reaching at the level of the angle of the rib, just in front of the angle of the rib, it gives a branch. This is called collateral branch, collateral branch. And most of the occasions, this collateral branch again it joins with the main uh, nerve. Or uh, sometimes it may run along the upper border of the lower, and then it runs uh, at the level of the. Uh, at this level, it gives another branch. This is the lateral cutaneous branch. Lateral cutaneous branch. This lateral cutaneous branch it divides into two. That is the anterior and posterior part. The anterior branch it goes and it anastomoses with the dorsal. Ramus of the anterior branch of the dorsal ramus of the now then it anastomosis. Here the anterior branch it goes anteriorly and medially, and it, again this uh, nerve it continues in the intercostal space. Finally, here at this level, at the lateral just one centimeter lateral to the lateral border of the sternum, it, uh, it comes superficial. Okay, by piercing the muscles. That is uh, at the here this is the internal thoracic artery position. Before inter, uh, anterior to the internal thoracic artery, here it is the intercostal. Now it pierces the this is the inner, internal intercostal muscle and the anterior intercostal membrane because here the anterior part of the next to intercostal muscle it is replaced by membrane and then it also pierces the pectoralis major muscle. Then it reaches the skin and superficial fascia. Finally, it, is, it forms the it is dividing into two branches. One branch medially it goes and it supplies to the skin over the sternum, and lateral branch it goes and laterally and backwards, and it uh, anastomoses with the or it joins with the this uh, anterior branch of the lateral cutaneous nerve of the intercostal nerve. Okay, lateral cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve. Okay, this is the typical intercostal nerve and its course. Typical intercostal nerve and its course. This is very very important. Because when introducing any uh, structure into the intercostal space, uh, you must be very careful. You may cause damage to the this intercostal nerves and blood vessels. So if there is a damage to the blood vessels, it produces profuse bleeding. And if you cause damage to the intercostal nerve, it leads to uh, loss of sensation over this area. Okay, that is why you must be very careful when introducing any structure, needle or any tube. You must be very careful with that. Intercostal space. That is why the intercostal space is very very important. Intercostal space is very very important. Next, uh, already you know that is the direction of muscle fibers is also very important. External intercostal muscle in the posterior part it is directed downwards and laterally, and in the anterior part it is directed downwards, forwards, and medial. Because here in the external intercostal muscle it is helpful for the Lifting the ribs during inspiration, lifting the ribs during inspiration, and internal intercostal muscle just opposite direction, opposite direction. It is a helpful for the expiration. Mostly, expiration is a passive process, but it's up to some extent it is helpful for the expiration. And apart from this, uh, there are some other important muscles that are also attached to the thoracic cage. That is, uh, sternum, sternum, what you call. Sternocleidomastoid and uh, levator muscles, uh, cervical muscles, and lattice muscle also, and the back muscle, all these muscles, uh, and diaphragm also helpful. That is, diaphragm is the mainly principal muscle. It is taking part in the formation of the, uh, covers the outlet of the thoracic. 
outlet of the thoracic. Okay. And here the thoracic cage, they say usually in the adults, the lips are oblique, obliquely oriented. But in the children, it is horizontal. Because in the children, it is below the age of four, three years or four years. The ribs are, direction of the ribs is horizontal. Okay, because of this reason, in the children, there is a respiration pattern is abdominal respiration. Abdominal respiration. Because in the adults, it is oblique like this. If it elevates, it increases the thoracic volume. Okay, if you lift the, these ribs up, it increases the thoracic volume. Then it is uh, helpful for the respiration. But in the children, uh, almost uh, they are horizontal. There is no increase in the size of the ribs. There is no expansion of the thoracic cavity because of the ribs. Because already they are in the horizontal direction. Because of this reason, the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles are taking part in the respiratory movements of the children. Because of this reason, then the children's the abdominal uh, respiration is abdominal type. In the adults, it is thoracoabdominal type, thoracic type. Okay, that is the importance of the this, uh, intercostal space and intercostal muscles. And another important thing you know that is a herpes zoster. Herpes, it is a viral infection. Just like our chicken box, it is a viral infection. It affects the nerve roots. It affects the nerve roots, and it produces bloods and vesicles along the nerve along the nerve root. The intercostal nerves they are most commonly affected structures in the uh, intercostal. That is the herpes zoster. Herpes zoster. After the herpes zoster, there is chances for the pain along the course of the pain along the course of the nerve. That is called intercostal neuralgia. Intercostal neuralgia. The intercostal neuralgia, most of the occasions, it is due to damage to the nerves by the, the herpes zoster infection. And in some occasions, it may be due to some uh, injury to the nerves. It may produce the pain along the distribution of the nerve. Okay, these are all the things. So, now we have to concentrate on the First rib, second rib, twelfth rib. These three ribs are very, very important. Next is the sternal angle. Sternal angle. What is sternal angle? Which level? What is its importance? What are the instant that is occurrences at the level of the sternal angle? That is also very, very important. Next is the what is the typical intercostal space? Typical intercostal space. What are the structures which are present in the typical intercostal space? What are the muscles? What are the vessels? And what is the now? And what is the course of the typical intercostal now? And uh, what is its clinical importance? What is its clinical importance? Here, sometimes there may be chances for the fracture of the ribs uh, on both the sides of the, suppose this side, this side, due to uh, there is a injury during road traffic accident, there may be grievous injury over the thoracic cavity. It may produce a compression of the this thoracic cavity from the anterior rib, and it produces fracture of the ribs on both the sides, both the sides, and it may produce a, there is a individual movement of the, the middle part of the this sternum along with the costal cartilages, and this is called this is this clinical condition is very very important it, because it may come it is along with the Respiratory movement, this part may, may not move. It may not move. And that is why that is called Friar's chest. Friar chest. This real chest is very, very dangerous clinical condition. Or sometimes these ribs may cause damage to the flora and it may produce bronchopleural fistula. Bronchopleural fistula. That means the injury to the flora along with the lungs. They continuously, the lung may leak into the this floral cap. Usually, it is uh, if there is injury to the lung, it may uh, heal by uh, within five days or one week. But if there is a formation of bronchopleural fistula, it is very difficult to heal the so damage to this lung, and it may leads to it leads to more uh, prolonged hospitalization of the patients and intercostal drainage tube also. Okay, these are all the things uh, you have to remember. And the other one, the abnormality of the thoracic, that is the pectus cavus and pectus carnitus, RPGN chest, these are also important. Okay, these are the things you have to concentrate related with the thoracic age. Okay.
debate in the next class. Thank you.